Welcome to the Tone Lounge Podcast, the definitive music industry and gear podcast with Jonathan Gilmet and Frank Fleckenstein. What's up, guys? Good morning and welcome to the Tone Lounge Podcast, episode 12. And uh, we hope that everybody had a great week so far. It's uh, Thursday again, so we're not so far away from ending the week and going into the weekend. With me, as always, uh, His Highness, <laughs> His Royal Highness, the <laughs> Duke of Boxington, <laughs> Jonathan Gilmet. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you live from, from Belgium. And for yes. all the people who all the people who cannot see us right now because they're listening to the podcast in uh on the way to work in the car and you can't see a screen. We don't have a guest today. But um kind of inspired by a recent purchase that you've made, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Or oh, not a purchase, it was a trade actually. You traded it was a trade, something. Yeah. It was a trade. Okay. Yep. Um, inspired by that, I thought, why not talk about something that apparently very few people only talk about here and there, which is, uh, seems to be kind of an expertise because you, uh, over the weekend, you traded some, some stuff and you got yourself what kind of amplifier? It's a Rivera M60, the head Rivera version. Rivera M60. Yeah. I, oh, I can see that behind you right now. Ah, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, right there. There it is. And what did you have to trade in to get the Rivera? I traded five guitar pedals, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, the story, like real quick story. Please. Uh, this yeah. one here had been kicking on, uh, there's a website here in Belgium called uh, Secondhand. So basically just people selling their secondhand stuff. And mm -hmm. this one here had been kicking around and the guy that had it, I've traded with him before, super cool dude. And I guess he didn't bond with the amp and he found it overly complicated. And uh, I, I sent him a list cause I got a shit ton of pedals and I was just look, looking to move some stuff. I'm way more into gu like guitar amps than guitar pedals. So mm -hmm. I got my hands on this one. I traded, uh, I think like two Wampler, like the Metaverse, the um, Terraform, and three Overdrive pedals for this. I, mm -hmm. He was happy with the trade. I was happy with that trade. And uh, yeah, I uh, went deep into trying to find out more about it because like he said in the intro, not many people talk about Rivera. And I was really curious about this one because it's the second time I'm being offered one. Mm -hmm. The first time was a combo like 10 years ago. But I didn't know the brand all that much. And because I didn't really educate myself on it, I passed on it. And I'm pretty sure if I didn't pass on it, I would probably still own the amp today because this thing's fucking killer, man. Yeah. That's that's a hell of an amp. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly it certainly is. And that kind of triggered the the idea for this this episode, for the topic of this yeah. episode. So uh this is going to be one of those what is it about episodes you know we had a uh we had an episode where we talked about vox amps which uh yeah. is actually one of the most listened to episodes so far along is with it? the one that we did with eric from uh living room uh gear demos oh that's because cool. uh, yeah uh i just i just saw that the other day i was like oh that's interesting they're kind of like taking turns with the lead you know these two episodes <laughs> so this episode is what is it about Rivera Ms. But before we dive into this main topic, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. And I'm holding this into the camera for everybody who can see it. If you cannot see it, I'm going to tell you what it is. This is a pink Jupiter FX Warlow limited edition pedal, which we are going to give away as soon as we reach 250 subscribers. We're currently at 212, I think, so we're not so far away from that giveaway. And the only thing you have to do is you have to su subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. Po subscribing is free. Hitting the bell yep. icon is free as well. Doesn't cost you any money, but you can win a really nice Jupiter Effects pedal. So, And another little detail here. You have to be publicly subscribed. Because if you comment on a video or whatever, and we can go look in the um, YouTube studio... 
So you have to be publicly subscribed in order to be able to be eligible for um, winning this pedal. Very good, very good. Good piece. Um, good piece of uh, of advice. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to put you into the um, into the. What we're going to do is we're going to give this pedal away in sort of a live uh, live fashion. Meaning we are going to do. There are these like generators online where you can put in names. So we are going to get uh, a list of all the 250 subscribers. We're going to put them in a uh, in a list and then shuffle them around. And the person get that gets drawn gets the pedal. And you have to get in touch with us in order to uh, well to get your address and and contact details. And then we're going to ship the pedal over to you. Apparently. My co-host Jonathan had some technical issues, uh, but now I can see him again. I did. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I I did. Uh, just, just a little caveat: the internet provider has been having issues since yesterday. Apparently, okay. it was resolved, and now I disappeared. It wasn't a magic trick. It was just my internet connection. <laughs> gotcha. No worries. I um uh, um I just explained. Uh, everybody how they um how we are going to draw the winner as soon as we have the 250 subscribers it's going to be super fair super transparent we're going to put all the names into a into one of these shuffle machines and then uh, the name that gets drawn gets the pedal very simple very straightforward okay can, can can i participate though i no no Fr friends Damn family it. and res relatives <laughs> are not allowed to participate like in all good transparent and uh you know, fair raffles. Because <laughs> I really like the pink version. I really like it. You know what? If okay. you want, the, I, 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 um, I can send you my. Do you have a regular version of the of the Jupiter Fix Warlow? I don't even have a, a version of the Warlow. Okay, so I'm gonna send you my version. You can have. Okay, I'll trade. You can have. I'll trade you. Okay. <laughs> you can have. I'll send you, you something. Have cool. mine. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> let's 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 do some let's do some trade. Um, do by you the happen way, to have a uh, Rivera amp? No, I'll I, trade you for if you. No, you don't have a Rivera amp. Okay, ah, what a trade since you. you. <laughs> si uh, since you posted yours, I'm, I'm again highly interested in them, and I've had some, okay. I've had some experiences with Rivera that that I'm going to share throughout this uh, throughout this episode. So, let's start maybe with a little bit of history because. A lot of you guys out there might have heard of the name Rivera in combination with maybe a certain artist. One of the recent, like more popular artists was uh, Mick from Slip, the guitar player of uh, Slipknot, who has a signature amp with Rivera, which is called the Seven. And um, so that, that that's one. But the history goes goes way back. So everybody who knows the history. Uh, Fine, maybe we can fill in some gaps or or not, but essentially, in the mid seventies, there was a there was a very popular guitar store in North Hollywood called Valley Arts Guitars. Valley Arts Guitars was also uh, was also very popular because at some point they started producing guitars, um, meaning uh, at some point they started making custom guitars for certain session players like kind of tailored to their specific needs. And um, they at some point, Valley Arts became kind of a hotspot for all these session guitar players, like guys like Steve Lukather, Tommy Tedesco, uh, Larry Carlton, many others. They came into the store for repairs, for customizations, not only of, of instruments, but also of amps and electronics, which was Paul Rivera's department. So he essentially oversaw that, and then he was, and the, and back in 1976, he was already consulting for other companies. So um, I think that one thing that came up when we talked beforehand was he was consulting for Yamaha back then. Yamaha was about to launch the the G Series Two amplifiers, and uh, a lot of his his ideas went into the final product. These amps. Back then, they were solid state. 
but they behaved and sounded very much like tube amps. And uh, they're still very highly sought after. So if you look at, uh, it's it's difficult to get those, uh, I think they're called uh, the G50-112 and the G100-2x12. Um, uh, and it's, yeah, it's uh, uh, two, the, the two series amplifiers. And they're still very sought after. So if you can get one, normally it's at, at, a, at a kind of a higher price. Um, kind of similar to the Lab Series amps that Norlin was producing back then, you know, where Bob yeah. Moog was involved. Um, yeah. They also were like l- kind of looking after this, okay, how can we build a solid state amp that behaves as much as a tube amp as possible? Um, so he was involved in that. Then, well, he continued to to modify and improve a lot of like different amps for session players. Most at that time, most of those amps were like silver face fenders, uh, the the amps from from that era. And he added stuff like he added channel switching, additional gain stages. Um, he added like a very cool like pre gain fat switch, which we're going to get into. Effects loops, master volume, so everything that the the session player needed, because these guys needed to go to the studio and offer a palette of sounds coming out of one amp. They couldn't, I mean, they could have bring more stuff, but time was money even back then. So you needed to yep. be fast, and you need to be able to to off, to bring something to the to the table. And um, I think we gathered a list of of like players who were using Reverber modded amps back at the time. And um, I think I've put it all together. So on my list, there is Steve Lukather, Chet Atkins, Jeff Baxter from Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers, Robin Ford, Ted Nugent, John Sykes from Whitesnake, Bruce Kulik from Kiss, uh, Jason Beeler, uh, the guys from Skid Row, Rudolf Schenker, Paul Jackson Jr., uh, Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, Dean Parks, uh, Jay Graydon, and so many others that yep. were using the amps, but also giving him input for like for for coming up with these modifications. They say they said, for example, talking about this pre-gain fat switch. They said, "I love my I love my silver phase deluxe reverb, for example, but there's too much information in the low end, and sometimes if I want to drive the amp, it's just it's it's just blowing up. So yeah. essentially, he put in a filter that would take some of the low end out to make the amp tighter, in a sense, you know, like in a in a way. Um, so a lot of these things obviously came because came into existence because these guys went to Paul and they said, "Hey, this amp uh, needs to have that that that. Can you do that?" So essentially, that's that's how he started. And I was digging into this a little bit deeper. In fact, Steve Lukather used a Rivera modded Fender amp for the recording of "Hold the Line" from Toto. Really? Okay. Yeah. So the the they since Paul added a second channel to the amp that and a master volume, so you could you could drive the amp. It would, and he also I think he also fiddled around with the tone stack. He extended how, what the tone stack could do. Um, and it had kind of a Marshall-esque sort of, sort of vibe to it. Um, so he was using that. And then that same amp was actually used on uh, Michael Jackson songs, including Beat It and uh, PYT. So... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's... Um what I find particular about this is that this is just an opinion. It's like my observation is that because this particular engineer, Paul Rivera lived in and around like Hollywood where all the big studios were back in those days. Yeah. It gave him the opportunity to work with people that weren't just like working in bars. These guys were touring. They were playing huge sessions. So he got feedback from them. So he, Not only is he like a great engineer, but then he's taking great ideas from musicians that were out in the field. He was taking all of it and building it for them and then like doing the research and development as he went along so he could perfect his gear. 
I mean, a lot of musicians that become like amp builders don't have that. Like they live like in Timbuktu somewhere, you know, mm. in a small town, they're building amps and all they really get to do is just take something that's already there before them and kind of improve on little things to their taste. But this yeah. is not what Paul Rivera was doing. He was actually like engineering and designing for specific people. And that's where you end up with monsters like this amp where someone like me, I come in, I'm looking at this and I have to spend a week with it just to understand what it's supposed to do, right? Yeah. It's not like a plug and play simple, like you just turn up the volume, there you go. It's way more well-developed than a standard like consumer type amplifier. Yes, 100%. And I think, I think, and that's also why the motivation or where the motivation comes from to, to kind of talk about Rivera, because we are always talking about these other guys whose name, whose names are out there and they're, they seem to be way bigger. So we're talking about Mike Soldano. We're talking about Dave Friedman. We're talking about, um, who else? Obviously we're talking about Dumble, Dumble you know, D Dumble yeah. is like, everybody, everybody seems to be talking about what, um, Alexander how Dumble did, and he also started out modifying Fender amps before he then yep. created his own sort of designs. And we always talk about these guys, and all the credit to them, what they did was was amazing, was amazing work, one hundred percent. But essentially, if you look at all the stuff that Paul Rivera did, he he took an amplifier that was not in, intended to sound a certain way, and he made it sound. He made it sound that way because, yep. you know, um, and that's, and that's where I think, uh, he deserves, he deserves all the, all the credit. And if you look at the, the M's, I think people get confused too easily by certain things. So you said, yeah, you look, you look at the amplifier and you're like, um, I need a week to go through this because yeah. What he did back then to achieve some of the extended functionality is he was using um, a push-pull potentiometers a lot. And then he yep. incorporated that into the amp lines that he would create with his own company, Rivera Amplification. And people seem to be thrown off by that. But in the end, it's like, if you don't need that extended, if you just want stock, you know, you don't have to you know, pull out the, the treble part or the bass part or whatever. Yeah. But if you do, if you do, uh, you'll maybe find something that you like better or that fits your needs better or that, you know, makes the amp more valuable, more flexible for you. So, yeah. um, so I think he, well, he started at, at Valley Arts in 76 and then around the, Beginning of the 80s, um, he was actually hired by CBS, who owned Fender back then. Yep. And uh, he, well, unfortunately, and I'm, st I'm not saying unfortunately in a bad way, but he was put in a sort of manager uh, or managing position there. He was there to oversee the Fender amp line. Yeah. And... Um, I'm saying unfortunately because apparently the only and that's what I could find apparently the only design that he act, that he created was the design of the Super Champ and then everything else he had obviously had a team of uh, of engineers uh, one of them still being a legend uh, around there Ed Jans um, uh, he was involved in in some of those like really. Uh, like groundbreaking, um, groundbreaking amps that that were made at that time, but essentially Paul had a team of engineers that then would be, you know, would come around and say, "Hey, uh, here is my proposal for what you want." So Paul said, "I want an amp that does that and that, and that we can build for that budget." And then they came around, and was like, "Hey, here is a design," and then he would either approve the design and say, "Okay, I trust you," uh, you know, go on, move on to the next stage, or he would not approve it and then they would have to look into you know how to improve the the schematics or how to improve the design um and then uh so what i could find was that he was he was he designed the super champ himself and then he directed the engineers and they came up with a couple of models 
the Baseman Twenty, which I've never I've never seen the Baseman Twenty before. I'm, I'm eager to, to see one. I haven't one. either. Yep. <laughs> the Champ Two, the the concert, oh, the Deluxe that's Reverb. A great amp. Yeah, it's it's a great amp. The Deluxe yeah. Reverb Two, the Princeton Reverb Two, the Twin Reverb Two. Essentially, like, um, like yeah, the the second iteration of what was there then with all the with all the with all the improvements. They also created a couple of solid state amps. Um, yeah. uh, some of the names that came up is the Howard, the London, the Montreux, the Showman, the Stage Lead and Studio Lead, and the Yale Reverb. So th those are were some those, of the... Uh, were they the Red Knob version of the like 80s Fender amps, or did that come later? No, that came later. Um, okay. Some people assumed that Paul was... was Kind of involved still in the in the red knob versions of the amps, but he was already he already was out of the company by then. Okay. Um. So yeah, those were all solid state amps, and then some f really funny thing: the 1983 amp catalog also included uh, rack gear, rack gear from yeah. Fender. So there was the the RGP one preamp. And the RGW one power amp, yeah. those, however, they were never sold. In the end, um, the, in the catalog, the price was set TBC, so uh, it was still in the development stage. I I would assume. And actually, yeah. you shared a couple of. Um, let me find that. All right. Can you see that? Yep. So here's an amp that. That Paul Rivera was involved in from Pictronics, which was called the Cross Mix. I haven't yeah. found any valuable information on the on the M, but uh, yeah, just one of these things that it was that he was involved in. Then here you'll see that's the Yamaha two series amplifiers that he was involved in, where he was consulting for. And then you sent me a snapshot of an interview that this one where they actually yeah. talk about where they actually talk about the so this is the this is the preamp and that's the power amp that has to be like four rec units that is huge <laughs> it's yeah it looks like it's a monster yeah absolutely and there are also some uh no oh, come on yeah so there's also you can you can you can still, or you can already see some, like, Rivera DNA in there because some of the stuff then ended up in his own designs. There is an yep. rack amp that's called the TRB, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, the TRB1, and there are different versions of it, but yeah, the first one was that, yeah. Yeah. Um, What else do we have? There's another snapshot, I think. Yeah, exactly. So like two channel, two channel amp with all the bell bells and whistles, um, mid boost. Oh yeah, with built-in reverb as well. And then it's fun. It yep. Has like has this this socket here for a for a panel lamp, <laughs> which is <Yeah. laughs> which is great, especially if you're operating in the dark. <laughs> yeah, dark stages. Yeah, because you yeah. don't know what the hell you're doing, right? So. Yeah. Exactly. So um, yeah, those were the thing is apparently they were never produced. So what we see here yep. might be the only like Fender, Fender branded uh, sort of rack, rack gear things that that were done, and then and then okay. Fender just you know didn't so, continue. Yeah, this, the snapshots I took is actually a podcast episode. So I watched the whole thing uh, a while back, and then I took some snapshots so we could talk about it in this episode. Yeah. But essentially what um, Paul Sr. was saying is that there were two units. So this one here, which is a tube version, and yeah. there was another one that was a solid state version that is kicking around somewhere in England right now. He doesn't know where, because what happened, there was a artist representative in England and uh, Paul Sr. sent him the solid state version saying, look, if you got some artists and want to try it out, let me know what they think and we're going to develop in that direction. Yeah. And uh, the rep kind of disappeared and so did the amp. 
So there's only two of them, but they were never like mass produced or anything because um, a little side note, Paul didn't know it at the time, but when he was hired, CBS already had the intention of getting rid of him. He was kind of like their yeah, fall yeah. guy. He was coming in. He had to develop a five-year plan for the company. He had to think up of all these, like taking some of the classic amps, but making them more modern. This was his attempt at trying to make like a professional rig for studio musicians. Cause yeah. I mean, we don't like for younger players who are listening to this, they might not really know what the gig was about, but back in the eighties and early nineties, everything was about like these fridge filled with rack mount gear. Yes. And th that particular unit was made so it could play with line level uh, reverb units or whatever. Also, like cons typical consumer gear that's like whatever minus 10 dB. So you had plus four and minus 10, and this thing could handle just about anything you threw at it. Because if you were taking like some of those rack units and you would put them through uh, the effects loop, the effects loop of your amp, it would clip, it would sound like garbage. So you mm. had to think about like putting independent volumes for the send and the returns. Yeah. There's a bunch of engineering stuff there that if you don't really know anything about the gear that was used back in the day. The technology might not make sense for today's application, but for back in those days, that was like revolutionary. He was way ahead of the curve, like way ahead. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's the thing. And it's good that the, yeah, what you just mentioned. So back in 83, yeah, CBS already knew they would sell Fender again and like, Yep. get themselves out of of mi essentially yep. after you know being there for like for like what two decades something like that yeah um and then kind of a sort of a political move in 84 uh paul is being let off from from fender um because they knew they they wouldn't pursue any of that and then in 85 cbs sells Fender to the new Fender management team. Uh, uh, they Fun fact, <laughs> they actually reduced the work, or the new management team had to reduce the work for us and force from 700 to 275. Yeah. Um, and uh, they operated out of a small uh, factory near Bria um, where they assembled the parts that were left of the amp line until roughly 1987. Um and because they still had they had still still had pre-wired uh like socket boards and they had chassis and, and all these things all of that stuff was still there it just had to be assembled yeah and then another fun fact in at the same year 1987 fender buys sun amps which we all know about it's like some of some of those sun amps are like also really sought after impossible to get um, and then they move into the Sun facility in, in Oregon. And that's where they afterwards started to launch the Red Knob series. So all of these amps, oh, okay. all the, the Fender amp line came out with the red plastic knobs. Yeah. Um, and that one was the first that was 100% PCB based. No socket boards anymore. So everything was PCB. Um, and that's why there are also people who think I've no experience with with red knob Fender amps, but there are people out there who believe that those amps are very very difficult to service to maintain, and they're also not mm. very reliable. So that's why yeah. some of the the red series uh, or red knob series amps you can get them at a pretty fair deal because people are like, oh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to deal with this. Yeah, and then. Paul Rivera launches his, his own company that up to this still up to this day is still running, uh, is still family owned and is still up and running. And um, he launched a couple of, a couple of amps over the years. And interestingly, uh, Paul has a passion for German cars. <laughs> really, I <laughs> and, didn't know yeah. that. And. Uh, it seems like he kind he is kind of inspired by what like the aspects of, of what German cars were like sleek, trustworthy, and reliable. 
And that's what he set himself out to to do with with his amps as well. He wants his amps to work under any condition, under any sort of circumstance, in in as many musical genres as possible. And uh, I mean, the the stuff that he did did definitely speaks uh, speaks for that because he did stuff for uh, blues players, for country players for session players who had to cover a wide, a wide range um and uh, well and also he he pleased metal players with some of the designs that he that he did yeah so um and then about 5 or 6 years ago um sweetwater sound actually asked paul to modify the 68 deluxe reverb custom reissues in the way they were modified back in the 70s. And then uh, and then Sweetwater sold those amps. So they essentially took uh, the the reissues of the Silverface uh, Deluxe Reverb and then sent them over to Paul. Paul made all the... the um, he had to do some investigation, obviously, if that was possible. And then he did the modifications like he did back in the 70s to players like Steve Lukather and such. Yeah. Um and sent them back and then they sold them off. But they also had like the the little uh like label stickers on on the side where you you know, pull here to get like more treble or yeah. uh mid boost and things like that. So kind of a quite kind of a funny thing. And it and actually a great idea by by Sweetwater if you think about it. Um That that makes me wonder though, why is it? that some people can recognize Paul's talent while others seem completely oblivious to it. Like it's so easy to see these amps kicking around, but there's not that many. If you really consider it, like how many Rivera's do you see on the used market? Like I've seen, and I'm not like exaggerating. I think I've seen three, like in my whole life, I've seen three Rivera's. That is it. Yeah, there was one that was offered to me when I lived in Canada. I saw a used one. I I don't remember if it was a Kiera or some other model, but okay. it was a, a combo. And I looked at it and I kept walking. Like I've even I am guilty of not knowing more about the company until I started to you know kind of question like why I why am I not paying more attention to these guys? What do they do? What's the Rivera sound? So I started to dig in, and that's where I started to see, like, dude, there's a legacy to this company. They've been doing stuff for a long time, and they should be on our radar. Why do you think they are not? I think it always comes down to the same very principle in this industry. You can have the best product possible, but... If you don't have the marketing around that product that makes people want to like go crazy about it and buy it, then it's probably not going to work out for you. Which is which sounds like a very simple sort of formula. It's like, well, if you have a good product, just make good marketing and it's gonna work. Obviously, there's no guarantee for that. Uh, we've seen people who have done extensive marketing for a lot of products and they didn't make it in in quotes uh, and their their product hasn't been successful and then we see others who just come up with a clone of something that you can assemble yourself and you suddenly they suddenly sell 10,000 pieces you know because yeah. the marketing around it was very appealing and invited people to participate and get in on the train you know Yep. And I think that's yeah. that's what it comes down with Rivera. It is we we have to acknowledge that this guy helped shape and create sounds that then ended up on on multi-platinum records such as like the Michael Jackson records and um yep. I mean I don't know how much Toto sold but Toto was very 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 popular Toto in the 80s. Was huge. Yeah, yeah they, they were huge big, in the yeah. 80s and the 90s. So they must have sold uh, a lot as well. So, um, do you, uh, question for you: Do you know because we were talking about some of uh, the musicians that use these? 
do you know what John Sykes used and on which album? I suspect that it's probably on uh, the White Snake, um, White Snake album. That I think it's like 1986. Yeah, the one that has all like the big hits, like "Is This Love" and "Still of the Night" and all those. So I'm wondering if he was using something like the TBR uh, S. I think, which is like the more distortion one. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that's what he was using. Cause I know around that time, um, like mid eighties to early nineties, a lot of like metal guys were starting to use Rivera stuff like Skid Row. I think the second album from Skid Row is all Rivera stuff. Mm -hmm. And cause uh, if it is uh, the um, self-titled album from White Snake, uh, that guitar tone is massive. Like for that time period, that was different than everything I've ever heard back in that time period. So I wonder, I didn't have time to look it up, but I just thought about it. Yeah, the, the thing is that, so I'm, I'm, I'm on his website, I'm on John Sykes' website now, where he talks about some of the equipment he was using. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, so it says like, for a lot of time, he was using Marshall's. Uh, especially 50 watt JCM 800s, and then for the White Snake or for much of the White Snake 87 album and the first Blue Murder album, John used two Mesa Boogie Coliseum heads. Uh, these amps have a Mark III preamp section, but use six 606 power tubes, given the amp 100 watts each. Are you kidding me? Oh. Um, John also used several Mark II C pluses, Mark threes, and some rack mounted uh, Mesa Dual Recto heads, and some other Mesa Boogie okay. equipment. So, yeah. Um, but that was in the eighties. I'm not sure. Uh, it's very possible that he came into the shop. He came into Valley Arts, and then Valley Arts, uh, and then Paul made uh, customizations to his Marshall. He wasn't. He wasn't limited to modifying fender amps it was just the thing that he became most known for um yeah. he also he he also modified other amplifiers um i'm not sure what the percentage is but uh i i'm pretty sure he also modified modified marshalls um oh yeah i'm, I'm pretty sure of it it's um because when you look at some of the uh interviews he's done like he was a consultant for a lot of companies, yes. like a ton of companies. And I'm sure he's picked up a lot of stuff here and there from all these different experiences, which culminated into creating his own brand. Yeah. And I, I don't like, you know, we, th we think Fender, we think Vox, we think Marshall, there's like a typical sound around these. Yeah. In your opinion, do you think there's a Rivera sound? Is there something that distinguishes them from the pack? Like you hear something, you go, that's a Rivera for sure. It's, it's, um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure that there is a Rivera sound. I am pretty sure that, that Paul Rivera was, was, um, Let's put it this way. He was the one who definitely helped shape the sound that ended up on records. But I don't think that there is that there is sort of a Rivera sound. Because okay. in the end, we need to look at like he he took something and improved it and made it possible to adapt to to, to many styles. It's difficult to dis to to distinguish and to answer really. Um, yeah, he did some he did some crazy he did some really crazy stuff as well. So I can uh, I can tell you a little bit of, about my personal experience with with Rivera. Back when I was working at retail in a uh, here in my hometown and in the smaller shop, so we had like the big shop that was like in the center, that was huge, and they had all the brands. And sometimes we wouldn't be able to get those brands because there was like sort of a like regional protection for certain sellers that they would be exclusive for that region. And so that bigger shop just uh, invested money into getting a couple of like high-end brands 
but they didn't invest money to get Rivera. So Rivera was offered to us and we're like, cool, yeah, uh, you know, let's let's start selling Riveras. And the distributor was happy. I was like, great, I'm, you know, I want someone who's capable of like selling these amps in that region. So we get Rivera amps. I had no expectations. I had no experiences with them. And then the stuff comes in and uh, same like you, uh, first I'm like totally thrown off. I We get this this uh, head, it was the knucklehead reverb, the 100 watt knucklehead reverb and with several uh, several cabinets. And I'm just like, oh, this is so many options. You know, I was like, what, I'm going, what I'm going to do. But eventually I got there and I was like, okay, there is something distinctive about it because you can make this amp work for you in any way possible. You can, you know, you can, you can, back then, lower tuning started to be like more popular. People tuning down the, the drop B or drop A or something. Yeah. And you could shape the river in a way that would, that where you wouldn't need some sort of a tightener in front of it. You know, it would, it would sound tight anyways, because you could take some of that low end out on the amp, on the amp's channel. And then what they also sent us was a cabinet, a, a which was called the Lost Low Bottom. I don't know if you have heard of that. Nope. Because it was, I, I think it was very short lived. But here's the thing: it was a three by twelve in a four by twelve chassis. the The upper two by twelves were. I'm not sure. They might have been vintage thirty. I'm not. I'm not sure what exactly. But the lower one, the lower one by twelve, was an active three hundred watts JBL. So they had a power okay. amp in there with a with a uh, with a frequency divider, and you could essentially you connect your amp regularly and then you could divert some of the lower frequencies to just be handled by that by that 1 by 12 which was a it was a long hop JBL uh speaker and a th and a 300 watt active power amp in there and then you could add that to the <laughs> and then you could add that to the <laughs> signal which at first we were like why would you do that you know is it uh yeah. Where's the where's the point in doing that? And then we tried it out, and we were like, "Holy shit!" This yeah. is like because <laughs> you, yeah, because <laughs> because you you take away some of the workload from the upper two speakers. Now they have more they have more capacity to handle all the low mids and the the mids and the, the high mids and what else is left of what high end for guitar speakers come out and then all the lower stuff would be <clears throat> but obviously if you crank up the power amp on that thing it would shatter the room it would absolutely shatter the room and i was like because i was playing in the band back then that was tuned to low and uh, that was uh tuned to drop a okay so yeah. i was like you know what i'm gonna take this thing on a ride i'm gonna take this thing on a <laughs> on a concert so i I I borrowed it from the store and we went on the show and um my batmates batmates they were already looking at me weird because this thing weighs so much because of of the active power amp and it's a yeah. it's a regular four, it looks like a regular regular 4x12 and everybody was assuming they get a 4x12 and then we play at the show and it was one of those shows where not that much of the guitar signal ended up on the PA system because it was a small it was a small club and they didn't have the the best PA system so it was all reserved for some parts of the drums and vocals obviously yeah um and then i'm i'm firing this thing up and i i played a diesel vh4 back then so i'm firing this thing up and my bass player looks at me <laughs> and is like are you for real <laughs> <laughs> Seems like seems like I, I can go home, you know what? So this yeah, thing, just get rid of your bass player. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna see if I can find images of that. It's it is absolutely mind blowing. Uh, While you're looking for that, the I think the found it, found the, it, found it. 
Oh, did you? Okay. Can you can you see that? Yeah. So that's the the two upper. I think they were vintage thirty, and then there's this uh, one by twelve. And here is an image of the back. I think uh, there you go. So here is the the power amp, the three hundred watt power amp. And let me see if I can find a close up. So yeah, the, there the you go. The power amp for anyone that that can't see the power amp is taking like if you look at a four by twelve where one on let's say the 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 left corner where a speaker should be that's where the power amp resides at the bottom there so there's essentially what three speakers yeah in uh in the cabinet yeah okay. um it was called rivera lost low bottom maybe i can find the oh there's also you can you could also get that as a single sub to add to your existing 4x12 so that was that that looks like a you know, a two by twelve, like a regular two by twelve. Yeah. But then on the back, it looks like that. So was there like a a crossover? Yeah. Between exactly. the amp, exactly. Okay. You could you could you could uh, define uh, the the crossover frequency with uh, controls on the back, and okay. then yeah, all of that would then be diverted to the the subwoofer, and everything else would end up in your regular speakers or. And that thing, I remember that there was a huge dispute about the sound because Steve Luca there was actually playing some of those. So he had like okay. two four by twelves, and they had he had the subwoofers below those subwoofers below the the, the four by twelves, and um, okay. they were playing a couple of shows in Germany, and the the guitar sound was like so shattering and if like coming from the stage that it would actually divide people to go left and right because they couldn't stand it <laughs> people were like that's insane dude yeah it's absolutely insane so you, 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 he was actually you could you could you could say that steve luca that was the modern day uh you know who, who was the guy who who uh who split the the, the red sea not sure oh moses it was moses right yeah it was the Sonic Moses. It was he was the Sonic <laughs> Moses. <laughs> he was uh, yeah, and people were like, "This is terrible. I need to move to the side." So, um, and uh, you then know, you could use something like that when you have a show and someone's injured and yeah. the audience isn't listening. You just roll this fucking thing out. You put it in the middle where you want them to part, and you just start playing, and everyone parts. The ambulance guy comes in to picks up the person and gets out and then you roll the amp away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new use for this amp. There it is. Yeah, exactly. You could yeah, I mean, and it's uh it's insane, right? Uh here's something yep. here is something about the panel. Let me see if I can Okay, so that's what the panel looks like so oh yeah exactly now remember this thing would actually go into your effects loop what yeah so you would use you would it would you would go into your effects loop okay and then um yeah you had obviously you had the, you had level adjust uh you had you could change the face if if you had phasing phasing issues yeah uh then the the cabinet itself also had an effects loop because yours was just busy with the subwoofer um yeah. and yeah and that's what it and that's what it looked by and then you had um obviously it so, gave you some indication on if, if it was peaking or something does it does that imply that let's say you could run I, i'm just like trying to understand the design here does that imply that you could have your amp head that has an effects loop but not use the effects directly into your amp and rather use them like let's say you have something like a Wurlitzer type of like effect or you know like rotating speaker kind of thing yeah and you want to get that bottom end without sacrificing your integral signal yeah does that mean you could plug into there so you have you would have like a wet dry rig essentially no 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 it was this thing um, no? so okay. since you needed to use the effects loop of your amp to be able to use the subwoofer um they oh, just okay. gave you 
the effects loop that you were then missing. You know? Oh, okay, okay, I see. But it was it was you. just a serial effects loop. So if you had a if you had a, a parallel effects loop, then that would be gone. So if you need if you absolutely needed a parallel effects loop, then uh, using that sub would not be not be a good option for you, obviously. Okay. Um, I was I'm interested for how much these things go for these days. Uh, let me find uh. that. For five hundred bucks. Okay, dude. No. That's okay. Frank, why do you do me like this, man? Now I want one. <laughs> like, I'm gonna have no use for one because no. I I don't play in bands anymore. But just the mere fact of being able to shake the house and perhaps break the foundation, eh, I'd like to try it. <laughs> why not? Why not? <laughs> oh yeah. Why that, the hell not? That was the that was one of the. Uh, let me see if I can. Get that bigger. Oh no, it's a forum. Oh shit. Um, does it open? Yes, it does. Yeah, so that's that's essentially what we had back in the um, in the store. You know, we had that knucklehead, oh, okay, uh, fifty-five or the one hundred version, and then this uh, three by twelve lost low bottom, and um, yeah. yeah. It, it it's incredible like I, i'm looking at the the foot switch here i was fortunate enough for uh my amp i got the foot switch i'll show you what it looks like mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is the foot switch yeah okay so it's pretty pretty elaborate yes. so essentially what you have is uh a foot switch that work with all the different models so uh the um, this amp here, the M60, there's the M60, the M100, and the M120. 120, yeah. So the 120 came with some built-in effects, so you have access to that on, on this foot switch, but it, there's no effect in my amp. So then you have the effects loop on-off, your reverb. There's a Ninja Boost, mm -hmm. which is just basically like a, a, a cleaner boost. Um, then there's a Slave Master and your Channel Select. And there's a few innovations because now you were showing us a cab that's pretty different than what we're used to seeing. Just gotta put this away. And some of the the designs in here stem from the TBR. So at first we were showing that Fender unit that he wanted to build, but it never saw production. So when he started the TBR, he integrated a lot of really clever technologies into the amp, which made it to these like distilled down versions of the TBR. So essentially there was a, the M version, which was meant more for like the R and B or clean headroom type guys who wanted a cleaner amp, more like Fender ish. Mm -hmm. There was the SL version of that, which was like the, the super lead, the more like hyped up Marshall kind of thing. Yeah. And this M series, has both of those distilled down into a more like user friendly, if you want to call it that, format with these with these amp heads. And if we went through these things, it would almost require its own podcast just to talk about some of the features. Yeah, because they are quite clever for the time period. And there's a manual like the previous owner gave me a pretty thick manual. Oh, I don't know how shit. many pages that is. But I went through it, and there's some shit in there that I'm going to have to reread because I get the gist of it, but I don't fully understand how to implement it yet. So the, the Slave Master part, my understanding is that back in the 80s, a lot of musicians were using like really loud amplifiers yeah. and sending them to uh, like soakers, if you will, like just to take down the volume as much as they could. But that would have an impact on the tone. So my understanding is that the Slave Master is essentially that, but built in to the amplifier. Mm -hmm. So you can overdrive whatever channel you're using. So if you have the Fender, but you want to like really drive it without being super loud, you kick in the Slave Master and you can saturate it as much as you want. The Slave Master part has its own effects loop, and then the ah, amp has its own effects loop. I see. So it's all these clever ideas that are thrown in there, like... Uh, on the channel two, which is the Fender side, 
there's a mid pull push uh, switch on there. And what he wanted to do was give you the EQ curve of a blackface yeah. or a tweed fender. Yes. <clears throat> so I, I, if I remember correctly, uh, this is like from a few weeks ago when I watched it, but essentially you have a, a uh, dip or boost in the 500 region mm. or a dip or boost in the 250 to 300 hertz region, yeah. which is synonymous with those older fenders. And then channel one is more of a like hot rotted Marshall. And they give you when like when you bought this thing, you would get this thing here, which was all the different settings you could use either Whoa. for channel one or channel two. <laughs> so if you want it to sound like a Vox, they tell you how to dial it in. If you want to sound more like a Plexi, they tell you how to. And this is just like the beginning. This is just like introduction. So if you think about it, it's almost like they were giving you presets yeah. for an analog tube amp. Who did that back in the 90s except Rivera? Not that many. Not that many. And I think you might have just answered the question, like, what is the Rivera, Rivera sound? It's well, it's I, whatever uh, it's ever you whatever you want it to be. Bingo. You know that that's why I was asking you earlier, like, what do you think the Rivera sound? And the the reason why I was asking you that is that it dawned on me yesterday while I was playing with the amp that if you, I I know it might be like a a stupid example, but I see kind of like Vox, Dumble, Marshall, and Fender as like if you look at it like a set of coloring pencils, mm. right? You get a small box, you have 10 colors, and you can do a shit ton with these colors, yeah. right? You can blend them to create new colors, if you will. I see this Rivera as like a big Prisma color, like 120 pencils with different shades of purple and gray and all this stuff. That's what that is, yeah. in my opinion. It's like, you get it, it doesn't have a foundational sound. It has the DNA of a Fender or a Marshall, and you can go from there and tweak it to your heart's content. Yeah. That's how I see this particular amp. Now, I don't have a whole lot of experience with Rivera because it's the first one I own and the first one I played. Yeah. But yesterday, while I'm going through it, I'm like, okay, if I don't use my head properly here, I'm going to get really frustrated because I can't dial in a tone. So what was the intention? What did they want to create with this amp? And this is made for the professionals. It's not made for a geek like me who just like did not play on Celine Dion's fucking album back in 89 and whatever. Mm. I'm, I'm just some dude. I did some touring. I played a shit ton of shows. I did some recording sessions, but not as a professional. I didn't do it for a living. Guys who were doing this for a living, it was more like, hey, um, okay, so we're going to hire you for a session. You come into the session. And back in those days, like I remember hearing about um, musicians who would come in with a, a trailer filled with amplifiers yeah. and guitars, and they would have them all stacked out. And then the producer would be like, yeah, I'm not liking that tone. Yeah, what do you want? I don't know, something different. Can you give me something uh, a little breathier? And then yeah. the guitar player would grab another guitar, change the settings. Well, you can't keep switching amps like that because those were big amps. But if you had something like this, you could tweak a few knobs. You like this better. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Cool. You don't have to dick around with different amplifiers and mic positions. You can just dial in what you want. That's what that is made for. At least that's what I think this was made for. People who are there, they don't have time to fuck around. I need that tone. Well, yeah, you want it to sound like a like a Vox? Well, they already showed you how to do it. Dial it in. I want something more like the Beatles, or I want something more Jimi Hendrix. You can do it, and that's what that is. It doesn't have a sound. It's whatever the fuck you want to dial into it. Of course, there's a few things it can't do. Like if we look at more modern metal like gent and all that that's not going to do it but if you're looking at like 80s and 90s rock maybe even some like early 2000s metal you could do it like you could dial in that tone or worse to worse if that's not enough gain for you throw a tube screamer in the front of it and there you are yeah and that's why now you can see why i had difficulties answering that question or finding like a, a yeah. proper answer to that question because yeah, it's 
I don't think you can define the Rivera sound. Um, it is whatever you want it to be, and along the along the way of like dialing in tones, you're gonna come across some tones that you associate with Fender Blackface amps, Fender Tweed amps, uh, Marshall amps, and as you said, even some you know like Voxy, Voxy kind of kind of yeah. kind of s- sounds are in the package, and that's essentially what Paul Rivera did from the from the start. He gave professional session players uh, a Swiss army knife, you know? Hey, here's a Swiss army knife, but the big one, you know? The wide one. Not the small one with like three or four things in there. No, the big, the big <laughs> ass one. <laughs> the big ass one. Yeah, where the big you Rambo can, knife. <laughs> exactly. Where you, can, where you can pull out, if you pull out everything, uh, you're going to have like 35 different tools, you know? Uh, plus your... Um, uh, you know, plus, plus your little pincet if you have a splinter somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Like every, he he's gonna give you he's he's gonna give you all that all that that what he that's what he essentially did and what he was famous for. Maybe that's the reason why it is more difficult to market these amps because you know if you if you go to market with a Fender ugh, reissue of some amp you know that fender did in the 60s then it's easy because you know you have you can say hey uh look look at that sound you know listen to look at that sound listen listen to that sound <laughs> listen to that sound that's that came out of this mid 60s fender amp here's the issue of it or marshall yeah. comes out with some kind of thing and it's like hey remember the 80s album from xy blah 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 that's the sound. That's the issue of it. So it's super easy. Or like mm. even for guys like Mesa Boogie. Hey, remember the corn album? Blah 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 bloop. Here it is. Here's the the issue of that very sound. So it's very easy to market these things. Um, yeah. And even further, uh, like if you look at the all these modeling guys, you know that just implement software into a piece of hardware. For them, it's even easier. They're like, hey, you want to sound like Limp Biscuit? You know, here's the Here's the preset for it. You want to sound like pff, periphery? Here's the preset for it. You know, here's a gen preset. But yeah. with Rivera, obviously, it is more difficult because they give you a huge array of, of tones to dial in that can be anything. And I think people have a hard time if they're getting too many options, bringing us back to like, some of the discussions and some of the conversations we had with with people so far in this podcast, where you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. um, I myself came to the understanding that the landscape of of especially guitar players is getting divided. Before it was divided into like many different kind of I don't know uh, chapters. Let's call it chapters, and now it's just it's just two sides. It's either I like to dig in deep and I like to, you know, fiddle around with shit tons of options, or I want a simple pedal. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to pedal with no. twenty knobs. I want to pedal with three, four knobs, tops. That's it. I want simple. I want to dial in something really fast, and I want it to sound good. These are like the two. And then, obviously, if you look at what Rivera brings to the table, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. Hey, here's your Swiss Army knife. It can do anything you want. And it's like, oh shit! Now I got to go through all these options, and I got to try to dial yeah. in. And it's, uh, I, I think that's the marketing part because marketing, you have to consider who you're marketing to. Like, yeah. if you if you consider like someone like Paul Rivera, all right, he brings his amp to a studio out in LA in 1991, and there's a famous studio musician there and he says hey give this a shot and let me know what you think about it well you don't have to market to like a hundred thousand people or a million people you just have to market to this guy and this guy is going to talk to his friends and his friends are going to call paul and he's going to custom make whatever they need so it's not a grand scale kind of thing Mm -hmm. so if you're looking at boss right boss i would assume are not going after like all the studio musicians in Japan to check 
everything they do. They probably have it part of their setup, but it's probably not the main focus because they sell everywhere to yes. everybody. Yes. You know, you want a blues driver, anyone can use it and get a good tone out of it. But if you made a blues driver that could sound like any other pedal out there, it would be huge. It would have a lot of knobs. It would understand. It, it would imply that you have to understand EQ curves. It would imply that you have to understand gain staging and all this stuff. And that's where musicians sometimes we lack the understanding mm. of what the person that built the piece of gear wanted you to do with it. Like someone like Paul might have thought, like, I'm giving them this. They can do just about everything they want with it. And then you get a idiot like me that goes, what does this do? And then you're listening to it. And if you don't get a tone that you love right away, ah, it's not for me. And you give up on it. Yeah. Because you expected it to sound good right away, just plug and play. Now, I've seen a lot of people on forums ask about settings. What are you What are you uh, using for settings for this channel? It's hard to say you should start with this setting because one, what room are you playing in? What's your speaker? How do you play? What does your guitar sound like? Do you have single coils, humbuckers? Uh, what pedals are you using? Are you using with it? Yes. It, it, there's so many variables there. So that's why something like this, you almost have to have knowledge of how those EQ curves work first before you can actually start to dial in anything that you're going to enjoy. Because yesterday I got some really flubby and disgusting tones where I was like, why the hell does the amp do that? Mm. But then when I would dial it in, I'd be like, oh, wow, this is inspiring. And I could, I found myself playing without actually touching the dials. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm testing out the amp. So I'd get back to it. <laughs> and then I'd fuck it up and I couldn't dial in that tone again. I was like, I should have written it down. <laughs> you know, That's how complex this thing can be. Yeah. But I'm sure like anything... If that would be my only amp, right, and I only played with this, I would be forced to learn the piece of gear before I could use it, which is not much different than someone using an HX Stomp or a Quad Cortex or a Kemper. Because nowadays, musicians have to learn their piece of gear before they can actually start to implement it in their rigs and start to use it for whatever they're getting paid for. Uh, you know, it could be like they're live streaming or maybe they're playing a live gig somewhere or they play uh, with their church or whatever. This is kind of like that, but like 30 years before. Yes. <clears throat> and I think, um, yeah, obviously there are, there's also this, this side, there's this like, branch of people that uh, they want things to be self-explanatory, you know, where you have like, let's say you get a pedal with four controls. I wouldn't even mind reading the manual on that, you know, different to yeah. maybe an HX Stomp. Uh, as the, I'm, t I'm talking average Joe, obviously. Um, I, I consider myself uh, sufficiently you know, expert enough to take out a a an HX stomp or an Axe FX and just dial in and and jump right into all the the different options. But yeah, yeah, uh, obviously. But the other thing that first I'd like to mention a a Rivera combo that oh, I think I'm not sure if they have a, no, it's just available as a combo. So kind of, Paul Rivera took all these these modifications on the silver face amps that we talked about earlier and put them into one of his own uh designs let me just uh show you my screen where are we there we are uh check that so that's the oh stage four that's the stage four and stage four is kind of a um, uh yeah kind of a fitting name because his like depth of modification for those amps would go in stages so stage one was like an easy modification maybe maybe an added effects loop if that is considered easy um and then at some point if you had like the full catalog of modifications that would be stage four you know stage four is like the, the highest sort of level so to speak so the stage four <clears throat> is kind of the um 
kind of exactly that. You can see, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that just like the the um, just like the silver face, like deluxe reverbs, it has the fat, like six position fat switch, uh, which is okay. pre gain, I believe, or at least pre. Uh, might be pre gain, not sure. But essentially, that that is like kind of puts together um, what he did with these uh, with these amps, and then I'm not sure, but this one this one actually comes with a with an Eminence EM12, which is sort of a um, uh, sort of an electro voice like the the EVM12 speaker, but the old one that's not that you can't get anymore because it's not long in, produ in production. You can get reissues of it. Okay. But that was the one that that had like a 200 watt peak uh, power and whatnot. So um, it was, f if you could really drive that hard and it wouldn't break up, it was yeah. always clean and clear. Um, Crazy. So that's the, that's the stage four. What I've also seen and what might contribute to uh, the difficulty of selling Rivera, if you look at the price of that amp, is 3k now yeah they're not they're not cheap they're not cheap now i know that yeah. this amp is 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 made in like by hand in 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 california in the united states uh fine 100 percent fine but uh in order to be uh competitive i mean if you look at three thousand uh euros or uh I'm not sure what the what the price of that in the US is. Let's let's find out. I want to find out because sometimes it's interesting to see how much more expensive things are uh if you look over the Atlantic. So the stage yeah. four, uh let's look at Sweetwater. Maybe we can find it. There you go. Two thousand five hundred dollars. If you Yeah. So that's essentially uh five to six hundred euros less if you take the con the currency conversion into account that's five yeah. to six hundred euros less and that's simply due to uh well taxes import duties and i'm sure that there's a distributor in between and that distributor no, wants to have yeah, yeah. wants to have money as well so yeah. that's the that's one thing but maybe we can find we can find more you know things if we look at Rivera's current line of products. So I thought we uh, just look take a look at the website and maybe we might find clues why it's difficult to market uh, to market Rivera um, in this uh, yeah in this modern day age. So what I can see here, they have six different heads different amplifier heads what's this one that's one that is the clubster royale recording so that's a 25 watt amp oh no it's 50 watt or 25 watt depending on the um, what kind of tubes are in there and um it actually has a couple of really nice and modern features so if you look at Look at that. So two speaker outputs, great. You can you can switch between two different outputs um, or output power. I think it's just uh, like puts the the output to fifty percent. So you can essentially switch off one uh, preamp tube um, line out. Um, it has an internal load, so if you want to use that without a speaker, you could do so, and then you have a direct out. You have a headphone out, and then apparently you can also you have a couple of voicings for that direct out, which definitely is great. I mean, a lot of those features are in the amplifier that I own. Yeah, uh, I think one of the exceptions would be the uh, XLR out. I don't have an XLR out, but I do have a line out. Yeah, um, and the voicing. There's um, actually some uh, features on the, the M60 that 
kind of affect the voicings. I, I think a lot of these amps take some of those ideas from like the initial model, which is really weird when you think about it. It's as if he created the holy grail of Rivera amps to begin with, with the TBR. Mm. And then he's just like picking and choosing some of the features and distilling them down to simpler, more practical models for you no know, everyday musicians. So, but there's a lot of the DNA from some of those older models in there. And it still begs the question, why are these features and like the sound of Rivera and everything they can do, why are they still not like at the top of the list of amps that we talk about? It's so this amp it's still baffling yeah, to me. So this amp would definitely compete with a couple of amps that I could mention from Mesa Boogie. Um yep. and uh let's say well it could also compete with the with the soldano astro i mean you don't have the extended ir capabilities but you still if if you're not into like dialing things uh in an editor uh you have six different voicings and the level control that's you know enough for most people um yeah. the question is so the rivera Club, uh, clubster, I got Royal <laughs> um, head. Where is this? No, clubster Royal, Royal head. Like to know? Yeah. Oh, that's a combo. It's impossible to find. Oh, so it's nineteen hundred USD. 1900 that's not too it's bad not too bad no it's actually it's actually oh. pretty okay so then we have the knuckle hat and the knuckle hat has some history obviously there were different iterations of the knuckle hat but that's yep. the uh, knuckle hat tree and the knuckle hat tree reverb um which is two channel 120 watts so that's like the flagship kind of kind of model tight bottom end um, ultra clean channel to K uh, K tree users include uh, Chino Moreno and Steph Carpenter of Deftones. Well, Steph Carpenter is using everything these days, apparently. Um, yeah, because it's like you know he's 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 using Mesa Boogie. He's using Marshall. He's using Fractal. He's using uh, so yeah. Uh, Meigs Rescoon of Cold Chamber, John Donay of Anthrax and Shadows Fall, Christian Brady of Hell Yeah, and Jason Hook of Five, Five Finger Death Punch. Um, but even Ziggy Marley and Al Anderson of The Wailers for clean reggae tones. Now, there you go. See, th those are new names to add to the ever growing list of famous musicians using Rivera. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and I mean, Corn. I I remember seeing Corn live, and they had knucklehead amplifiers on there, and they had they had the the terrible subwoofers that was, you know, that were like chopping uh, people's heads off. So um yeah um so there's that yeah that's that that's kind of the okay here's our here's our flagship here's our flagship model. You get all the headroom, you get all the features and everything, and um, the knucklehead tree comes in at uh, difficult to find difficult to find something yeah. uh 2800 still reasonable you know if you look at what still reasonable yeah if you yeah. look at what what dual amplifiers uh dual rectifiers sorry dual rectifiers cost these days um if they're available you can't I, even buy them in Europe right now Mizabu is like completely dead in Europe at this point so but but it, it, from what I can tell, Mesa Boogie has always been an issue in Europe. Yeah. Uh, like I was reading up because I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I was reading about like how hard they were to, you know, acquire back in the 1980s. That's where the German brand Kitty Hawk came yeah. in and started to do like these hybrids of like Dumbles and Mesas and all that. Yeah. So I mean, now we're at a point where it's still kind of hard. And anything that's American boutique seems to be hard to get in Europe. Yeah. Whether it's Bad Cat or, you know, brands like that. They like I there was a time where there's there was a shit ton of Bad Cat products on the Toman websites. And 
a few months back and was looking and there was nothing. They didn't have any. So I think the main issue is not, uh, do you have great products that appeal to people? I think the main issue is how are you going to get to market? How are you going to get to market in certain territories? And um, if you are if you are a a manufacturer based in the U.S., it's very easy. You just have a dedicated salesperson that reaches out to all the you know all the stores and eventually all the chains, and you start marketing and selling these things, and you're good to go. It's it's a it's a lot more difficult getting into other territories because. A, there might be other regulations as far as like what you have, what kind of um, like things you need to comply with on a technical level. I know that it's that it's very very difficult in Canada as well. There are a lot of things that apply in Canada to uh, regarding how products need to be made and what kind of certifications you need to have to actually sell stuff into Canada. Yep. Um, and the same applies for uh, for Japan. Japan is very difficult as well. It's it's very complicated. Um, so it's a little less complicated with Europe. But then again, so if we look at Bad Cat, great products, amazing stuff. But uh, I think it's difficult to get them because there is no proper distributor, or there is not yet an established connection between some of the bigger sort of stores. Such as Toman, Music Store, Henderton's, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as to uh, you know making the establishing a connection and then actually start you know making business, and that m- I think might also apply here for Rivera, where they where they have like <clears throat> they have amazing products, but in order to be able to sell into 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 the EU for example you either need a couple of strong uh, stores that are willing to take the line and to actually commit also financially to some extent or you need a distributor and distributors are more difficult to get these days because there are less and less distributors willing to take a risk um, yeah. but there are also less and less good distributors. Uh, but that's another. That's a topic for another, uh, for another podcast. Because it's, yeah, there's some. It's an interesting topic, though, because it is. We it is because if you look at like your angle, and I agree a hundred percent with you, is like reaching a certain market. The laws that are in place with the different countries that all plays a huge part in it, and I think if a company can manage to like secure a certain market, they will usually invest in it because it's so hard to go reach other people. So if you're an American based brand and it's easy for you to have access to, you know, Sweetwater and Zounds and all of these like different outlets that are pretty big, you know, and they have a lot of reach, then it's easy for you to tap in because you already know the laws. Like if there's like different state laws and all that, I'm sure like it can be more complicated than what this little Canadian knows. But then when you start to deal with Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands and France and all these countries, they don't all work and operate on the same way, especially for marketing. Like in Canada, you were mentioning that marketing in Canada is different. So for example, I know that it doesn't, 100% 100% relate to what we're talking about, but it's just an example of how complicated it is. Mm. So in Canada, when it comes to marketing, let's say you market on TV. If you're a company that is marketing for children, you cannot address children directly. So if you're watching Saturday morning cartoons with your kids, you can't have the American style, like, this is the new character, blah, 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 and then the kids are fighting. You can't, like, you can't target your ads specifically to kids because they don't want you to influence the kids. Interesting. So the ads have to be more elaborate for the parent, for older consumers. Mm. So if you start to look at it from that angle, if all countries have different rules and regulations about how you can market in different countries, it would take a team of people to figure out all the different laws for marketing 
And then you have like branding also, like, let's say, I don't know, you come up with the clubster and that's a thing in your country and that's the name of your amp, but then you want to sell in, uh, I don't know, you want to sell in Belgium and there's someone else here that is building amps and they have a clubster. Maybe you have to change the name of your product for that market. And you're thinking Belgium, there's 11 million people there. Not a whole lot of fucking musicians. Nah, fuck it. I'm not going to Belgium. So then yeah. Belgians, if they want to buy this particular product, they have to buy it from somewhere else. And then they have import taxes. They have all. So the the access, the easy access, like if you think of Toman, if you go on Toman, you buy it, you know it gets over here. But if you have to go through some small company, they don't have the same reach and power. That might affect who you can reach in terms of sales. And it's all shit that was probably much more complicated back in the 1970s, 80s, because you didn't have the internet where you could look up this shit. So you'd have to like cold call someone in, uh, I don't know, in the, in the Netherlands. Hopefully they speak English. They can tell you what the laws are and try to find like a someone, some kind of middleman so you can get your product out there. And that's just like one massive part of this. And then there's the online influence you know mm -hmm. whether it's facebook groups forums youtube videos uh you know the, the the sky's the limit here on what will influence people like myself i want to buy an amplifier which one do i buy you go top 10 best amplifiers it's always the same things that come back up right yeah. it's the same brands the same models and then you see like the vox ac15 is like always in the top 30 every fucking year of top sales throughout the world. And then the blues junior also is secured there in like maybe the top 10, mm. but you don't see Rivera's, you know, there's, there's other brands like that, that you hardly ever see, you know, a, a brand like Laney Laney's been around for a long time and they made some iconic amps, it's true. but they're kind of like Rivera in that sense where you see them, but you don't necessarily think of them on, par with Marshalls or, yes. or Vox or Fender, right? And Rivera is not the only one here. There's other companies I'm sure we could dedicate, a, you know, a solid two hours to where they have an incredible lineup of gear, but we just don't talk about it. Like for guitar, GNL. Oh, yeah. GNLs are fucking fantastic <laughs> guitars. But, you know, to people, they're not Fenders. Uh, how about Ernie Ball? You know, the Music Man guitars are fucking phenomenal but people like the resale value on them is not there but if you want to buy one go look at the prices you go holy shit six grand for a guitar and then if you look at it on the used market it's almost cut in half sometimes yeah. more yeah it's know? true it's true so perceived value sometimes for the people who know they're willing to put in let's say like we were talking about earlier uh three thousand dollars for an amp head they're going to go, yeah, that's the amp I want. But if you're buying stuff and you're kind of like undecided about gear, you might not buy a Rivera because if you look on the used market, you might be like, oh, resale value is not there. So you might be hesitant to buy that. But if you buy, I don't know, like a Mesa Boogie or you buy some kind of reissue, uh, Marshall, something like that, the resale value tends to be typically a little better, if not yes. much better. So there's all these variables to the marketing. Like you can market to me and appeal to me and I, I might put my bottom dollar on what you're doing. But if I'm like hesitant, I'm like, okay, yeah, I might buy that. But what's the resale value? If it's not there, hmm, now I'm trying to think more like a, a guitar collector, which I'm not, but you still try to put on that hat. Like, is this a worthy investment? So I think that's where a price for a, a Rivera amp, they're probably totally justified. If you look at how much R&D they put into it, the quality of the parts, everything. But to us, like the majority of the people that might not pay attention to Rivera, we might look at it and go three grand. I could put that on a Mesa or I could put that on, you know, maybe a Friedman or something else that I know if I don't like, I'll sell it and I'll get my money back out of it. So it's another, another angle that's super important that we don't really address, but it might be something that companies, if they start to look into it, might be able to market 
why you really need this and why the, my, you might not b need to buy another amp. Because we we buy a lot of shit. Guitar players, <clears throat> yeah, we, we buy a lot. Yeah, we buy a lot of stuff. And um, and there th there was a good point that you made. And uh, it's I think it's another aspect of this industry that makes it so it makes it much more difficult and it is the fact that you buy something and something inside of your head somewhere around the back of your head tells you that you might not stay with this thing until the end of times you know you, yep. you so you always have in mind that you might sell it at some point because you know your your taste might change or you might want to go digital or you know, at some point, you don't want to carry that thing around. You want something smaller. So, it seems like, and it's and and it seems like it's something that is specific to guitar players. Yeah. Where like I don't ha I've, I have not seen many bass players changing their rig every two years. You know, they usually they usually stick with a even with a with a bass with a with a bass guitar brand. You know, they like music man basses so they stick with music man and then they find an amplifier that works for them that's great and then they usually stick with it until it's broken and then they usually buy the same thing again i haven't seen yep. bass players like uh you know first i'm buying the hard key and then then i'm buying the the gallian kruger and then i'm buying the warwick whatever yep. um they don't do that keyboard players and synth synth guys they usually when they're in the digital realm, they usually go with, okay, there is an update to that product and it gives me more features and it gives me like more easy, you know, I can maneuver it more more easily, especially in live situations. So I'm going to upgrade from the synthesizer 4 to the synthesizer 5, you know? Yeah. That's what happens there. But with guitar players, and that's where they're specific, they buy an amp and they always have in the in the back of their head, they're like, what is the resale value of this going to be? Is it going to be stable price-wise? Because I might want to sell it in, in six months because we, you know, my taste changes, so I need something, I need something different. Whereas if we look at, if we then look at Rivera, we're like, this thing can do anything you want. You, you could stick with it or stick around with it until the end of time, you know, because it can do a lot of, a lot of things. Um, yeah. I'd like to get uh, back real quick on something that I found very interesting on okay. their website. So before the little cutout, we were looking at the different heads. So we look at the clubster, we look at the knucklehead, we then there's the, the Mick Thompson, which is like some sort of some sort of an adapted uh, tree, knucklehead tree, but then with specifics for Mick Thompson. There is a, a Jay Graydon. Uh, signature, which is um, so giving you um, we, we can actually look at that real quick, so it, this is just a limited run, it's 25 pieces, and it's like Steely Dan tone uh, smooth high gain um, and then yeah, this guy was session guitarist he played with George Benson, Algero uh, Eldebar, Sheena Easton, Art Garfunkel you name it, like lots of he was playing yeah. for a lot of guys, so this is this is this looks to me like a stage four, but it's a limited head. Okay. Um, and then you have the Venus and the Venus Du, and this is, for example, that's an amplifier. If I if I open that up and I look at it, and I'm like, mm, the best tube amp for pedals on stage or in the studio. That would be an amp for me because I'm primarily somebody who shapes the sound with pedals, so I need some something with lots of headroom. And this thing is a super simple, non-master volume, fifty watt, uh, clean amp, with a with the with the stuff that you expect from uh, Rivera to have. You know, you have the the bright pull, you have the notch pull on the mids, gives you like the thing between tweeds and blackface. So in the head department, I think this is all. This is this looks all very self-explanatory. Yeah. The thing where I'm having trouble with, if I'm going to the combos, A, there are a lot of combos in here. A lot of combos. And sometimes yep. I can't kind of 
put them apart uh, or take them apart in, in terms of... I look at the Van Dango and the Kiana and the Sedona. And if I just look at the, the front panel, they look the same to me. And let's say I'm average Joe. I'm, I'm going to Rivera's website and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm in the market for a, for a tube combo with like some nice headroom. And I look at these and I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to buy? You know, I look at the Fandango, the Kiana and the Sedona. The Fandango, 55 watts, two foot switchable channels, four different style of cleans uh, on channel two, an American or British rock and blues on channel one. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Kiana, 55 watts of 6L6 power. Okay, we have different power amp tubes. Four different style of clean. <laughs> channel 2, American or British rock and blues on channel 1. Sedona 55. Uh, okay, that's that's kind of uh, acoustic and electric guitar amp. Okay, we found a difference. We found a difference. So this one is actually, um, what is it? Uh, Doyle Dykes. So it's a collaboration with uh, Doyle Dykes, who is like a Nashville finger-picking legend. But yeah. Yeah. Between the Vandango and the Kiana, I'm like, okay, what am I going to what am I going to choose? And that's where the kind of dilemma <laughs> uh, sort of sort of starts. You know, I don't think it's clear enough to people what all these do. I I understand it with the heads. That's uh, pretty pretty easy, and I, and I understand it with the stage four because I know what the stage four is, but then. Yeah. You have all these all these others, and maybe it's too much. You know, maybe there's I, I, too I, much I, choice. I'm I might have an answer for you. I'm not in the know. Like no one's like given me this information, so I'm not privy to anything that no anyone out there might not know. Mm -hmm. But he worked, and you you've mentioned this before. He worked for Fender. I remember you telling me that when you tried uh, the Fender Tone Master unit. They had a bunch of fenders that were essentially all the same circuit, just with different speaker combinations. Yes. Okay. That might be, and like I said, I'm not privy to any information. That might be what this is. It's circuits that are very similar, but with different wattage, different speaker combinations. So depending on what you want, they come in different formats, but they're all based around this architecture of fender clean tones which this guy was known for hmm. with the modifications that he was known for so i'm assuming that this might be the variation that's why there are more combos available than head formats hmm. like he was known for all the fenders in the 80s that were like like the concerts and all that so this is essentially what he keeps going with with these yeah. amplifiers i might be wrong but that's kind of the way i see it okay yeah, it's possible. I mean, uh, there's. Uh, I didn't find. A, um, what is this? So there's a G12T75 in this one. I'm not sure about the the Kiana. It doesn't say anything about the. Oh no, it's a vintage 30. So yeah, we have different speakers in here. Um, but you kind of get my point, right? If I if I if yeah, I yeah. look at all this, I'm like, okay, but um, what exactly? What exactly is is for me and um what is something what is the most universal sort of amp they all seem kind of universal in, the, in a way because you can achieve a lot of different tones with them yeah um and then again look at it from a, from the view of a of a distributor so you're a you're a european distributor and you look at all of that and then you have to think okay how am i going to market this you know how am i going to tell store owner a who has like a small or medium-sized store and a certain cl uh, uh, client base that that's the right one for his client base and then how i'm going to go to toman and tell them uh you know you have to take the whole range <laughs> because you're, you're big and they people expect you to have everything yeah um and it's yeah i think i think it's difficult i however i think that some of those amps especially the the simpler versions they are super interesting and i'm i'm i would i'm super eager to for example play the the venus 2 this one yeah 
This one looks amazing. Um, I can tell you from experience, the Fandango is one of the best guitar tones I've ever fucking heard live. Oh, okay. there was a uh, there was a guitar player in my town. Uh, he played in a small band called Goreflex, and okay. they were kind of like doing like this goofy rock thing. And these guys were just having a hell of a fucking time. But they were all like musicians that played for cover bands and stuff like that. And when okay. they got together, it was a trio. And this guy had to cover a lot of ground. Mm. And what he would do was use the clean channel and crank the fuck out of it. <laughs> yeah. And seriously, it is still today one of the best guitar tones I've ever heard coming out of that amp. Okay. And I've never seen one since, but I've always told myself if ever I see a used one and I can't afford it, I'm going to grab one because seriously, it was epic. Okay. Really fucking epic tone. And I think his, if I remember correctly, I think his was a 212. Mm. Yeah, they, as they opposed had 212s, to what yeah. we're seeing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, seriously, like like I said, incredible, uh, incredible tone. And I know he used it for just about everything this guy did. Uh, right. You know, he would throw a couple pedals in front of it if he needed it. But most of it was him plugged directly into the amplifier. Yeah. Then Rivera also has a couple of um, accessories. So the mini rock rack is a reactive inductive load box and speaker emulator. So essentially what he built into some of the, the amplifiers, you can also get that as like an external device, which is great. Um, can easily handle up to 300 watts of two power. Holy shit. Okay, that's a... That's something. That's a that's definitely a, definitely a lot. And then there are different yeah. iterations of that. So this one... I think so. Yeah. yeah. So that's the... And that's the Rock Crusher. That yeah. one has more controls. What do we have? Oh, why is this so small? Because <laughs> they're old pictures, maybe. Yeah. Studio. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Attenuate. Okay, you can adjust the attenuation level. Um, in steps. And then actually fine-tune it. Okay, change a couple of things as well here and on the back. I oh, know that's an old picture. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Th then the Rock Crusher, like, didn't it have a pretty elaborate EQ section that came with it? I'm not sure, but there's also the Rock Crusher recording. Ah, ah that's the one. Now okay, we're yeah. talking. Now we're talking. So yeah. that's essentially the same thing, but then you can really look at, like, um, yeah, EQ on off. You have a padding. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. This is this is really that ticks a, more boxes. Um, and it looks like it's all analog, which is great. And some people actually uh, want their stuff to be fully analog. So yeah, yeah, I remember. <clears throat> uh, sorry uh i think it was like maybe 12 13 years ago it was like a long time ago i remember seeing a video probably on the uh, on the rivera youtube channel where slash had used this in the studio mm. and was using it for his live rig as well and he was like one of the first people like i thought eventually he was going to come out with like a signature amp with these guys which would have been massive at the time oh yeah yeah but uh yeah, he was just using this and um yeah, I remember at the time I was thinking like that looks awesome cuz the only real attenuator that I knew of that was kind of meant for studio was uh the Power Soak from Rockman. Mm, yeah. And that was like early to mid 80s. Yeah. And no one had really taken the concept and developed on it and brought it to a more modern uh stage. But this, I remember seeing that and thinking like, yeah, that's awesome. Then I looked at the price tag and I was like, yep, I'm not buying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Out of De my league. Definitely. Oh, then that's something that it, that already existed. A simpler form of, of it already existed around the time that I got into, uh, into like, you know, contact with or in touch with um, Rivera. So that's that's a really solid super sturdy MIDI controller that also has like relay switching built in. 
Okay. Um, and it is it has two interfaces, one for Rivera amps, so you can control Rivera, and you can also at the same time send obviously MIDI, uh, MIDI out. So that's this thing is really 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 good and a, definitely an alternative to some of the stuff out there um certainly an alternative to one of the most used the the, the rocktron midi made is one of the most used uh midi controllers i prefer i prefer this one every day because yeah. uh it's it the rocktron midi made is uh, the at some point the knobs are going to die on you like the, I'm sorry, the the, the the buttons, these these kind of rubber sort of buttons, yeah, they're going to die on you, and then you have to buy new ones, and then find someone who can replace them, and that's not the case. These this thing, thing is built to last. So, um, so you just said something really interesting, and I think uh, this is worth mentioning. War, who can replace them? Now, also, when you look at more elaborate designs, yeah, who can fix it? Like uh, I was on a forum um, dedicated to uh, Rivera amps and one guy said, yeah, I got the same amp as you, but my amp is dead and I cannot for the life of me find a technician who's willing to fix it. Oh yeah. Cause they open it up and they see the inside. They go, fuck this. No, too much work. Yeah. And they put it aside. So then you end up with an amp that is essentially not repaired because all the people that are looking at it are not qualified enough to fix it. And it's another worry moving forward. Like if you have to change like leaky caps or whatever in the amplifier, who the fuck is going to do this in 20 years? Yeah. A lot of the people coming up are going to be great with computers and electronics and AI technology. But when it comes to fixing these amps, because my understanding is that the M60 and some of the other models from the eighties are different. Um, like they have different PC boards for the different section of the amplifier. Yeah. So they're all like different amps in parallel and you open it up and it's like, if you don't know what you're looking at, you're going to need the schematics and you need to be charging by the hour. Cause it's going to take you a fucking long time to debug and find what the issue is with the amp. Yes. So that's something else you have to think about. That might explain why their current lineup is more distilled and, like simplified circuits where they are more serviceable. So if you bring it into like some Joe Blow who does repair in his basement, he's pretty good with electronics. That person's going to be able to open it up, look at it, find the problem and service your amp. Yeah. Whereas with the M60, the previous owner brought it into someone who's of reputation in Brussels, had it fixed over there. So I'm lucky for that. But, you know, it's like, let's say when I'm gone, let's say my kid, inherits all my amplifiers and he has to get it fixed who the fuck is going to fix that in 30 years there might not be many people around that can do that yeah it's a, it's a good question i mean nowadays it's difficult to find a technician that is able capable and familiar with a lot of these things i mean if i look at here in my region i could name two i could name two people who are actually uh capable of I'm, I'm giving i can give them any kind of amp tube amp or whatever kind of electronics and look into it and it's like okay i can i can i can definitely find the issue and then we'll find out how much the repair would cost but yeah it's it's very very it's very very difficult and it's not going to get better yeah. because obviously people have a different focus now and everything is getting more digital and You'll have a lot of guys yep. who can program the shit out of stuff, but they won't be able to open one of these things up and tell you if they can repair it or not. You know, so yeah, that's 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 an and it's not just unique to Rivera. It's if you think of any elaborate designer, like even Mesa. You know, you open up a Mesa boogie, a lot of like the you know something like the Roadster or Amstead oh. are way fucking elaborate. Uh, if it's just like some guy down the road fixing them he's gonna look at it and say sorry man i i can't fix this find someone else exactly Ooh, you bring it to a music store and they have a, a tech there the tech's gonna be like we're gonna have to send it to this other place and that that's gonna cost you and yeah. it's a subject we haven't really approached yet but it's a concern of the simplicity of the amplifiers 
should we start as musicians start to learn like just basic stuff about electronics so that we can maintain this shit going oh, ourselves yeah. you know because at some point you know let's say like i'm not getting any younger here and let's say i'm still around in 20 years i have an issue with one of my tube amps who do i bring it to a lot of the guys that are fixing them right now they're much older than me they might not be around in 20 years yeah who the fuck do you bring your amp to well, a lot of kids right now are not going to be interested in learning the electronics from these things because it's it's antiquated. The, the only times you see them is for guitar amps. And now we have modeling, we have all this you know, new technology, and we, we haven't even approached what AI might do to the gear that we use in the future. You yeah. know, it's like there's a lot of fucking possibilities there. So if you're a dinosaur and you have all the, like, you have a small museum in your house where you have all these old tube amps, who can service them moving forward? It's starting to be an issue now. And I think it's going to be an even bigger issue in 10, 15 years. Yeah, it is. And um, I can sense that in the far future, somebody is going to be able to ask ridiculous pricing for fixing amps because there's going to be a scarcity of people, you know, that, can service oh, these uh, oh, absolutely these amps. Yep. Um, I just found a section here that says discontinued and legacy, and there's there's not much on there which I find interesting because I know that there's there's one product that I'm going to point out after this uh, that definitely okay. belongs in there, which was to me was uh, before I discovered the solutions that Two Notes did was absolutely groundbreaking. So in this. Uh, this continued area we have obviously we have the the 68 uh deluxe reverb reissue that was then yep. you know the, the story that i told earlier so where he applied the same modifications on that he did on the amps from that time and he also put the little stickers on you know which is yep. uh which is great and those were sold through uh sweetwater i believe um these mods are what Rivera, Paul Rivera called stage two. So that was like the stage two sort of uh, modification level. Um, then we have a couple of things here that, yeah, you have a Pubster. I know, I still know the Pubster, the Clubster Real from before, the Clubster Dosse, uh, which probably tells us is a 12 inch speaker. And then we have this thing here, which is the TBR5. And. Um, this is <laughs> a two hundred a three hundred and twenty watt one hundred and sixty watt per side all tube rack mount power amp. <laughs> absolutely crazy. This is absolutely yeah. This is absolutely crazy. I mean, the only other uh, the only other power amp that I have ever seen that had that amount of wattage was the Mesa Bowie Strategy. Which was like a four hundred watt, two hundred watt per side thing, which is, I mean, uh, absolutely insane. Uh, this one uses sixty five fifties. Okay, so uh, apparently that means you don't have to use that many. Yeah, eight of them. That's fine. Uh, but yeah, can we just talk about the size of the fucking transformers in that thing? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you if you don't have those then you can have as many tubes in there as you want. You know, the transformer yep. is what definitely gives you the headroom and what drives this whole... It's like the engine, you know, the engine, while the tubes are like kind of the, you know, the, the moving parts, the, the gasoline in a way. Mm -hmm. But uh, those transformers are definitely the... Uh, the engine that's for that's for sure so yeah you should see the uh the one that's in my amp yeah i, I took a look in the back i was like oh are you kidding me that's why the amp is so fucking heavy <laughs> look at the size of this you could sink a boat with it <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so one thing that's not in there and i think it deserves some attention is a product um from rivero that was called the silent sister have you ever heard of the silent system? Oh, yeah, system? I remember those. Yeah. yeah. So back before we had all these kind of cool things that two nodes makes and like all these attenuators with built-in speaker sims 
etc., etc. People, if they wanted to record at home, they had to either have a digital solution, which back then really sucked. You know, they they the tone was yeah. terrible because they were yeah. they were just starting with that, or you would need to have a silent cabinet. And a silent cabinet essentially is like a closed cabinet with a speaker inside, and then there is a whole lot of isolation going on. And this way you can crank an amp, and you can... you Most of these things had like, um, yeah, attachments to put microphones in there, and then you had like wiring that would go out through XLR collectors. And back then there weren't many options. You had one from Randall... Oh. There was an ISO cap from Randall. That one sounded absolutely terrible. Um, I had it once. I used it. I, I got it once for my for my apartment because I wanted to record stuff in my apartment, and it sounded absolutely terrible. And it's not because people might assume that well, it's a speaker in an isolated cab. You put a microphone in front of it. What can happen? But there is yeah. still air moving around, and and that has yeah. to go somewhere. And there is still some sort of not a reflection, but a resonance. And that resonance is going to weigh into whatever comes through that microphone. So when yep. I tried the, the the Randall ISO cap, it sounded nasally as hell. And it it felt like the only thing it had was mids and nothing else. No more information, just mids. So that got thrown out. And then I, I actually got myself a silent sister to test and that was like that was a blast that was a blast because yeah. paul rivera took way more time and was way more um into let's just get the uh so that's the silent sister he was way more into like okay how can we how can i make something that doesn't have these issues with all the resonance so he actually created pathways for the sound to uh, be diverted. So the resonance and like some of these weird, well, not reflections, but some of that stuff would not end up in the microphone. Um, so that thing definitely deserves some, some credit because it was, back then, it was the only proper solution for home recording, cranking your amp, being able to crank your amp. Um... And yeah, sadly, it's not around anymore because now there are these other solutions and he has the Rock Crusher and we have all the stuff from Two Notes and, and the Oxbox and whatnot. We have all these other uh, all these other solutions. But yeah, I just wanted to point that out because uh, back then, nobody seemed to pay attention to it. Um, but it was, uh, to me, that was like the, the only really usable isolation cabinet. Unless you and build, it's unless you build one yourself, of course. Then <laughs> you yeah, might well, be. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was gonna say. Uh, I remember a lot of people seeing like ISO cabs like this and thinking, "Man, I can I can build that myself." So they would buy you know stuff at the hardware store, put their cabs together, and they would record. And if you don't know anything about recording, you're just getting in there. You're just happy to hear your sound, right? Mm. But the thing is, is that. It was still for a lot of homemade cabs. It was still way too loud for home use. Yeah. Still way too loud for even stage use. And if you like, if I'm not like a super geeky like audio guy, but you know, you got standing waves, you got all sorts of things acoustically that yes. can go wrong in a box. Yeah. So there needs to be absorption. Uh, there needs to be some way for the air to move in those ISO cabs yeah. because it, that's that's putting a lot of strain on the speaker. So the speaker needs to move air, and if that air gets compressed in there, the speaker is not moving in an optimal way. So there's a few things there you have to consider. So when a company like that, and you look at the amplifiers Paul Rivera was making, if he's making an ISO cab, yeah. it's probably going to be rock solid. And then you were talking about some of the options, like, you know, you had your XLR out that could go to, you know, your console, front of house, whatever. This was at the time, the only sort of silent solution that you could find. Yeah. Eventually now we have like all these digital options, which are way fucking advanced when you consider like the possibilities with digital. Yeah. 
But if you're to ask me my opinion, like if I could trade in my two notes for an analog solution, I would go 100% with an ISO cab because those are so fun. You could use whatever microphone you want. You can experiment with mic placement. It's not the same as having a cab in a like great environment, like a good studio, but at least it's better than recording in a really shitty room without any treatment and having all this like bad acoustics coming through the recording and you having to fix it in post. Yeah, exactly. So at least it gets you closer to having a semi-final product. Now, if you're using two note stuff, of course you don't have to run into that because they've accounted for that when they created the IRs. Yeah. But some people will swear that there's a massive difference between putting a microphone in front of a speaker and having moving air and, and an IR. Personally, I've I've made the test between both of them. The only real difference is that the IR is static. So that's that microphone that many ish, inches away from the speaker. That's it. While if you record with your own microphone, you can move it around to your heart's content, change microphones like you want. Of course, there's a little more flexibility there with is. the analog part. Yeah. But, you know, if you consider something like that, like if you can get your hands on one and have it in your home studio, that means, you know, you could use whatever microphone without bothering your neighbors. Yeah. It's still a great option even today. Yeah, well, I agree. 100%. Now, there's, there's one section we haven't talked about yet, and um, it's the section that um, is, and I'm going to show you this in a, in a second. Um, disclaimer, I haven't played Rivera's pedals myself. I've seen a couple in like in preparation to this podcast. I've seen a couple of demos and they, they like just the, the sonic impression is they they sound great okay but take a look at that i'm not sure i'm i'm a fan of the visual aspect to be honest uh -huh. so what do we have we have um the 3d shaman chorus vib vibrato first of all i i definitely give them credit for the for the enclosures because they don't just buy enclosures off the shelf like the, the typical Hammond enclosures uh, these seem to be made especially for them and uh, what what I also give them credit for is if you look at it if you look at it closely you see that this uh, where the, the switches are is actually a little bit elevated so uh, you won't be able to accidentally hit the knobs at the same time you know yeah 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 so it's staggered so yeah. the foot switch is slightly higher than the knob which are yes. recessed just a bit deeper in yeah yeah so it's a little bit higher so that means you, you're going to hit the knob but you won't be you know hitting uh, you're going to hit the 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 foot switch you're not going to hit the one of the knobs yeah because you got it almost like an inch clearing yeah uh from uh, the top of the foot switch to the 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 knobs exactly so, yeah. um, and then, yeah, input, output, you have some interesting things. You have like a wet right and a red le uh, wet left. So this would be, huh. you know, uh, determined to be in a dry, wet sort of setup, which is great. So we have the, yeah. I give them credit for that. Then we have the, the acoustic shaman chorus, kind of an acoustic version um, adapted for acoustics. We have the blues shaman which great but i think this this thing is way too big for just a couple of knobs i think it's it's they i it's i understand why they wanted to keep it consistent with the enclosures but um yeah. you know you could make this thing a lot you could actually cut this in half and and also have like two foot switches on there it seems to be very big for a pedal that is essentially some sort of like blues overdrive with an additional um what is it a gain boost yeah some sort of gain boost um yeah i think um and what do we have here the double shaman so that's essentially two of these in one enclosure um again looks great but there's a lot of 
space there that I don't think is is really necessary. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, wasted real estate for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, then we have the Metal Shaman, where I'm liking the visual aspect a little bit more than with the others. So this one looks um, looks nicer uh, to me. It's got like a Aztec, Aztec kind of yeah. sun. Yeah, exactly. And that's the Metal Shaman. And then we have the Sustained Shaman, which obviously is some sort of compressor with uh, blend capability and true bypass. So, yeah, all very nice. But again, I the visual aspect and some of that, yeah, as you said, real estate that's, that's there no. makes me think that, you know, as great as these pedals are, um, there is, at least to me, there's room for improvement. The visual thing is obviously a question of taste. People like it, people yeah. don't like it. But the real estate thing, I think these things are very huge for uh, for what they are. I don't know how much they cost. Uh, let's are, see if we can... Are, are these still available? Apparently, they wouldn't be on the website if there were not. Um, okay, so it's not part of the legacy. It's still... No, no, that's... Um, okay. They're not. So let's see what I'm, I'm just has. curious to see what they look like if oh. you put them all on a pedal board together. They would I'm look fun, though, what, <laughs> if you put them yeah, all. But that, I think they would. But that would also be kind of a big pedal board, you know, if you look at all yeah. the... <laughs> um, so I don't find that much... St I find one thing here. That's a German seller. Um, 186 euros. That's actually okay. Uh, but it's already yeah, reduced. So regular price. price was 220 um okay what else yeah they don't seem to have many people selling those rocket music i had uh, you you mentioned it but i had never even heard of the rivera pedals yeah and that's the thing uh, rivera is known for for their amps yeah, and not for their pedals, but I think, uh, in order to be relevant, uh, they maybe thought about okay, let's um, you know let's throw in a couple of uh, of pedals so um, we can I don't know we can be part of part of the market part of the movement. I'm not sure yeah. what the intention uh, intention behind it was, but. Um, and I see that they put a lot of work into this. I, I, I'm, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not discrediting any of that. It's just to my personal taste. I look at that. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not super excited about the visual aspect, and I'm not super excited about how much space these things are taking uh, on my pedal board for the options that they bring to the table. That's just my options. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's also the the quality of the build. There's the quality of the sound you're getting, and the reliable reliability factor too. Because um, I mean, just going off of the short experience I have with Rivera, they seem to be making gear that's tailored towards the gigging musicians. So that yeah. means. Now, the foot switch has to be able to take a beating. Uh, yes. The knobs have yes. to be reliable. The pedal overall has to be functional, but long term. So for the price range, I would expect something like this to probably probably be really good, if not stellar. So for me, like as a consumer, if I bought something like that and I found my sound, like I was like, holy shit, uh, let's say the blue shaman is like fucking killer. Like yeah. that's the sound. Then I would find some kind of way to integrate all the other pedals with it on a pedal board. But if this is going to be like one of those things where you stick it in, you you know try and see if it works with your rig, and then you plop it out and put another pedal in, maybe the size factor is going to be an issue because yeah. it looks from the design that I'm seeing that these were meant to be like an ecosystem. They're made to work together. So you would have like a pedal board filled 
with their stuff and they stack perfectly together. They're all top mounted jacks too. Mm. So they don't take up too much space that way. But uh, yeah, I'd be curious to try them out because I mean, I, I, that's what I do on my channel is like pedals and pedals and pedals. I didn't even know they made pedals. So yeah. <laughs> now I might have to like ring them up and say, Hey guys, uh, I'm really interested in trying out your pedals. So what do you recommend? Um, and also what I've noticed just now is this website definitely needs a revamp because if you look at the, so yeah, Facebook. Okay. YouTube. Okay. Instagram. Okay. But Google plus, Google Plus is dead for like four years, so I'm not sure where this is yeah. where this link would go. And Twitter is now X, so <laughs> if they're on Twitter, they <laughs> might uh, they might consider uh, you know changing some of that. But then again, if you're I'm just gonna stop this. Um, so looking at all the stuff that we talked about, what are what are like your key takeaways from from this little excursion into into Rivera amps, I have a few. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to put that out there because <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, else it's just going to stay in my head and I'm going to be like stuck yeah. with it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so the I think there's a few key elements here that I, I are really interesting to me. One is. I've always heard that if you created a great product, like a great product, the marketing wasn't that big of a deal, right? Because you created something that people are going to want. They're just going to come in, like magically find your whatever it is that you're making. Yeah. And as a musician who the only product, if you want to call it a product I've ever made was music. And I can tell you that is horseshit. Because you can work your ass off making an album. And if you don't have the right marketing strategy around the album release or the single release, it will fucking flop. And I see that this doesn't just pertain to musicians. It pertains to the actual business of music gear and music in general. So you're seeing someone who's obviously brilliant and talented and forward thinking but the one place, like just about every sub theme that we've had throughout this podcast so far is marketing, marketing, marketing. Yeah. Everyone seems to have an issue with the marketing because the marketing is not just, okay, I'm going to put $30,000 into an ad campaign that is going to run for an entire month with Guitar World. Mm. That doesn't work anymore. No. Okay, so how do I stay relevant? The landscape of music has changed drastically in the last 10, 15 years. We have new players with new philosophy towards gear. So if you want to stay relevant and you don't want to be a dying breed, that means that even though you have great ideas and great products, if you're not on the tongue of the average musician, like when people say, what's your top five brands? Vox, Fender, Marshall, if you're not in there, you're underneath, you're going to struggle to maintain relevance because you're not a household name. Yeah. That means that people are not going to talk about your product as easily. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to do like younger companies like JHS, yeah. which have a YouTube channel. They're making content all the time. They're talking about other brands. They have their brand in there too. You have to find some way of staying relevant and you have to know that the old guys with the graying shit in their beard, you don't need to convince them so much you're great. You need to attract the new players that are coming up and have never heard of you. Yeah. So, and and that's tough and you can't do that as a, uh, let's say a pedal, uh, pedal builder, an amp builder, a guitar builder. You can't do that all yourself. So that means these companies in my opinion, should reach out to younger people who know how to market because it's fucking astounding how many young people know how to market themselves, hmm. know how to reach audience, how to make products that go viral. And you need these young entrepreneurs in your team to help you with social media, staying relevant, 
making sure that this new product you're working on, you're not going to drop drop it on Monday morning and send it out to 10 big YouTubers and they're all going to spam YouTube on the same day. Yeah. It's a strategy, but it's one that's pissing off your audience because they're going, oh, great. Yeah, there's a new pedal. Uh, how do you know? Just turn on your YouTube. You're going to see like every YouTuber you can think of has put out. That's the new marketing strategy. Yeah. And it's not that great. Right. Yeah. So final thought, because I, I, I mean, I could ramble on there forever, but my, my initial thought here would be that for companies, not just Rivera, but other companies, if they want to stay relevant, they can't educate themselves on YouTube and Instagram and Snapchat and learn all these different uh, mediums. They need someone that could be just one person or two people bring them into their team and make sure that they can get the word out and make it relevant. And this way they're going to get to know their audience yeah. and they can start to pivot right towards a new audience. And you can see there's a pivoting there with Rivera where they're simplifying their content, not their content, but their products. They're making amps that are, you know, more utilitarian for average musician and not necessarily for guys like Steve Lukather, you know, guys that have elaborate rigs and are playing on a shit ton of albums. Mm. There's less of that today. There's way less studio musicians than there are average consumers. Yeah. So that's really my, my takeaway from this. Um, on my end, <clears throat> it's like, so we're looking at a company with where, where the, the, uh, the core, the core guy, uh, Paul Rivera senior, has been responsible for kind of revolutionizing how some players interact with their equipment in certain situations, whether it's live, whether it's in the studio, and even on a couple of really famous recordings. You have this guy who was in charge at Fender during a time that many consider to be one of the best times when it comes to innovative amplifiers, which was like between 81, 84, 85, when these uh, like Rivera era amps came out. You have a company that is in the hands of that very family for 40 years now. So like 40 years of the same owner. They haven't sold the company to anyone and apparently they are still alive. So there's the, this company is still working for them and it's still generating enough income and revenue for them to keep it, to keep it alive. I look at all that and I'm like, I have to agree with you. It is, there is, marketing is, is key when it comes to this very, very small uh, very, uh, yeah, kind of niche sort of market. Yeah. It really it 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 really depends on how you're going to market things to certain audiences. the The question is: Is there a chance for Rivera to get like more recognition and more, yeah, to to get their stuff in front of more eyes without them you know <laughs> and they got broke because they spent it all on marketing that that seems to be that seems to be the question and i think uh so for everybody listening if you have not ever uh, laid eyes on any rivera product i highly recommend you do so uh, i highly recommend you look them up on youtube because there's a shit ton of demos uh, out there, people who really know how to play and to show all the the aspects of an of an amplifier. There's one very, very cool video that Tim Pierce did on the um, not sure if on the stage four or on the Venus Do, not sure. One of the one of those models, and he makes it sound absolutely absolutely killer, mm. and it really shows the full potential of those amps and of, of uh, Rivera, mm. Rivera amps in, in general. So, um, yeah. and maybe, you know, 
uh, look at that direction as well. We are always talking about, as we started this uh, this episode, we are always ta talking about all these other names. Um, and we think these guys are absolute gods at what they did. Well, Paul Rivera is too. Paul Rivera is, is kind mm -hmm. of kind of the 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 uh, the underdog uh, god, if you wanted to, you know. Hey, there, there's a parallel there between. I'm making a parallel just because historically it kind of reminds me of that. Remember Carvin? Yeah. Okay, so Carvin was making like fantastic guitars and fucking killer amps. Mm. They had a guy like Steve Vai just promoting yeah. them, right? Like you thought Carvin amps, you thought Steve Vai. Mm -hmm. And when they kind of like went under the radar, I was like really bummed out because I knew the quality of what they did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it, it's a fucking shame that a company like that would go under. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kiesel was kind of like part of the Carvin brand and they became their own thing. And Kiesel now, great reputation. People love their guitars. A very modern, uh, you know, different mindset, but still stems from that Carvin legacy where sleek guitars with great options. And Rivera's kind of like that too, right? They're, so you have these companies that are forward thinking. They're really trying to give you Lamborghinis in terms of gear. Mm. Like it's not, you're just, you know, if Ford is reliable, you can, you know, drive it for a long time and when you get with these like models that are like fucking hyped up people go nuts for a while and then yeah. eventually you come back down and you start to play your fenders again and then someone mentions that you know dumbles are like these unicorn amplifiers there's not that many yeah. they sell for a shit ton of cash and alexander dumble was like one of those guys that you know would sit down with the player, would watch them play, and would like tweak the amp to that person. So if you played it, it didn't sound the same way. And so there's a lot of like mystique around a brand like Dumble. And then you think of Rivera, it's like, who gives a shit how you play? Tweak the fucking thing. Yeah. Tweak it. You'll find out how to make you'll find out how to make it work. You know, just spend time with it. I don't know I don't need to sit here, watch you play the fucking thing and try to tweak it to you. You got all the options there. Yeah. Figure it out. Exactly. And that's something that we don't spend enough time doing now. It's true. And that's why if you if you were to modernize this concept, you have the people that buy something like an HX Stomp, and then you got the people that make the presets and sell the presets for the HX Stomp. Yes. Because putting in the time, and this is, I'm not throwing any shade on anyone here. It's just a fact of guitar players. A lot of guitar players buy the unit because it's practical, but then when they start to dive into it, they get lost. They get furious at the unit. They would much simpler, a much simpler approach for them would be to buy the presets or buy, you know, something like a Kemper profiler yeah. and buy the profiles from someone else because they they'll try it, but they they won't be able to figure it out themselves. And I think that might be why something like Rivera, something like Carvin. Uh, companies like that where they try to give you the power to sculpt the sound how you want might not work for everybody it's going to work for the geeks who are willing to like go down the rabbit hole and figure it out but for the people who are less inclined to know about the science and you know compression and eqs and all this stuff and acoustics they just want to plug in and have fun right away and they just want to be able to turn a few knobs and that's it yeah, yeah. so the marketing there it's, you have to know your audience because if you don't know your audience and you're trying to appeal to everybody, a lot of people that want simplicity are going to look at something like an M60 or, you know, the TBR. They're going to be like, well, what am I going to do with that? Yeah. I don't need that. Just give me a, give me a Fender champ and you'll see, you know, I'm going to squeeze some great tones out of it and they will for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. But it's just something that's too elaborate might not be, for everybody yeah that's a very good that's a very good closing argument something that's uh too elaborate i tried yeah <laughs> very good closing <laughs> argument cool okay uh, i guess that sums it up as far as our uh uh rivera amps uh special episode um what are your experiences with 
with um, Rivera Amps, let us know in the comments. Have you ever played one? Did you like it? Didn't you like it? Have you never played one? Would you like to play one? Um, leave a comment and maybe also comment it to to Rivera themselves, so they know where to you know where to market their amps. If there's like more interest in certain regions, then uh, it might help them. And um, as for everything else, if you want us to talk about certain topics that you think are not talked about enough, then yes, please leave that in the comments as well, because, you know, um, there's already a lot, lot of people talking about all the stuff that everybody else is talking about, and uh, yep. we specialize in the stuff that nobody's talking about, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyways, thanks uh, for everybody uh, listening in to this uh, episode. Um, I think... What I would like to do before we close this down, um, I'd like to take a look at my at our calendar, just a second, because I think um, I want to kind of tease what's going on, what's what's coming up yeah, next. We've, we have some pretty awesome guests. Yes. Come in. So, um, so next week's episode, uh, which is going to launch on the 22nd, uh, our guest is actually going to be Frank Falbo of Falbo Guitars, which, uh, oh, I have so many questions for this guy. Um, not only <laughs> not only because uh, he has been in the business for such a long time, but uh, uh, yeah, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, and then uh, on the 20, 29th, we don't have a guest yet, but uh, we have a shit ton of, of topics that we've collected, so... We might uh, we might find yep. something. Um, then we have um, on the seventh of March. Uh, our guest is going to be Thomas Bluk from Blue Guitar. I'm excited about that one because uh, yeah, that, that's going to be fun. Uh, Thomas yep. is a is a really good guy. I like him very much, and his products are stellar. So, and then on the fourteenth of March, uh, we have Brian Wampler as our guest, which is also going to be very, very interesting because uh, yep. Brian is a guy that is very transparent about uh, the mis mysterious ways of guitar pedals, and he has been like very uh, educating, especially during the pandemic where people sitting at home, he was like, he was like yep. one of my inspirations to go like deeper into the pedal topic. So these are our upcoming guests, and... Um, yeah and we have some more in the works we have some more in the works so uh yeah there's uh two more people that i'm working on right now and you know today's episode uh, has really inspired me to maybe try and see if i can reach out to either paul jr or paul senior yeah. get one or maybe both onto the podcast because i'm sure if we picked at those guys brain man it would be <laughs> we, really interesting we, yeah you, Oh yeah, because you, you you have to keep in mind too that uh, Paul Junior has been soldering since like I think he said eleven years old. So Man, he's been amazing. like helping his dad, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure he's just as brilliant. So getting one of those two or both of them on the podcast would be fucking awesome. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'll see if I can make that happen. Yeah, definitely. All right, then uh, yeah, just uh, what, what's left is to wish you guys um, a great weekend, and uh, we are going to. Talk to you again on next week's episode. Episode. Yep. Until then. Looking forward to it. Until then. All right. See ya. <laughs>